The scripture we are focusing on today is a letter written to comfort the suffering believers in the book of Hebrews. However, unlike what we might expect, the letter doesn't simply say, it must be tough, endure it. Instead, it helps us understand the meaning of our suffering in light of Jesus and the salvation that comes through Him. This salvation is so significant that in order to receive it, we must go through a process that can feel like suffering. It's not something that can be easily fixed or resolved. Rather, it's introduced as a natural part of God's power and His way. First, the text discusses the greatness of salvation. Unlike sending an angel or appointing Moses, God Himself comes to achieve salvation. And not only does God come, but He accomplishes salvation by taking up the cross and dying. This emphasizes just how incredible this salvation is and reminds us that the one who accomplishes it is none other than God Himself. We are to remember the magnitude of Him walking the path of death for us. Naturally, this leads to the question, who are the ones being saved? What kind of beings are we that God would do this for us? This is part of what the text addresses. Today's passage begins by saying that God did not subject the world to come to angels, but to us for the sake of salvation. The message here is not that angels will be the heirs of God, but that we humans will inherit God's reign, becoming heirs and rulers of the world to come. This idea can be difficult to grasp. Salvation is not just about avoiding hell or going to heaven, nor is it simply about living happily without tears. The book of Hebrews testifies that salvation is something far greater and beyond these expectations. That's why verse 6 says, What is man? that you are mindful of Him, or the Son of Man, that you care for Him. It's a stunning promise, revealing our incredible worth and the purpose of creation and salvation. Humans are often defined by morality, intelligence, or the absence of disruptive behavior, but the value of our existence goes far beyond these things. We are beings created with an intrinsic worth that can't be explained merely by usefulness or societal roles. The promises of salvation and the testimony of Scripture often seem almost too abstract or unbelievable for us to fully grasp. It is as if the enormity of who we are as humans is too overwhelming for us to accept. King David expressed this awe in Psalm 8 when he asked, What is man that you are mindful of him? or the Son of Man, that you care for Him. This sentiment is also reflected in Job 7.17, where Job cries out, What is man that you make so much of him? He questions why God is so involved with humanity, scrutinizing every moment of our lives. Haven't we all asked similar questions in moments of despair or frustration? Sometimes we may even think, who asked to be born? Why can't I just be left alone? It's a natural response to the difficulties of life. In such moments, we wish for a life without burdens, without having to think or worry. We might even wish we were something simple and lifeless, like a rock that doesn't feel pain or fear. There's a similar sentiment expressed in literature where the rock symbolizes quiet endurance, being struck without making a sound or breaking without complaint. While this may reflect a particular emotional response, it's not the full picture. Scripture takes a very different approach. Speaking of humans in the most positive and unimaginable terms, it tells us that we are made a little lower than God. Here, the phrase a little lower doesn't imply a vast gap. It means that in terms of our status and position, we are almost like God. Ontologically, we cannot be the same as the Creator, but God gives us a purpose that far exceeds anything we can imagine. How can we know this? Because God Himself, through His Son, came to us, endured shame, and died on the cross to fulfill this promise. This is no ordinary event. It is the foundation of everything we understand 
about Jesus. Believing in Jesus, trusting in his sacrifice on the cross, and knowing that he loves us, these truths find their strength and foundation here. This is why Paul writes in Romans 8.15, 17, You did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. The challenge, of course, is that suffering accompanies this glory. If it were just about receiving the glory, we'd all raise our hands eagerly, wouldn't we? But suffering, not so much. However, the relationship between God and his children is unique. It's not based on fear. Even when parents discipline their children, it's not done to destroy or abandon them. This is the key to understanding the parent-child relationship in Scripture. There is no fear, only love. This is why the Bible repeatedly says, Do not be afraid. Fear has no place in the Christian faith. Sincerity and seriousness are not the same as fear nor should they be accompanied by hostility or anger. True sincerity exists where God is present, and His presence removes fear. In places where God is absent, we often mistake harshness or extreme measures for sincerity. Let me share a lighter example. Think about food, like noodles. Good cold noodles need flavorful broth and good noodles. If the noodles aren't good, you might opt for spicy noodles instead. But if even those noodles don't taste good, then they're just spicy, and you end up sweating without really enjoying or savoring anything. Sometimes our sincerity can feel like that. There's no real substance, just an effort to be intense or meaningful without any depth. But Scripture continually reminds us that Jesus' death swallowed up our fear. Love has swallowed up fear, though we may struggle to live this out. God loves us. He is our Father. This is what the book of Hebrews emphasizes, urging us to affirm this truth. Ephesians 1.17, 19 explains this further, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which He has called you, what are the riches of His glorious inheritance, in the saints. The text goes on to explain the greatness of his power toward those who believe, showing that Christ was seated at God's right hand, far above all authority and power. The church is described as Christ's body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. God's fullness is made complete by our fullness. This reflects a parent's love. Anyone who has raised children knows that if your child is happy, you are willing to make any sacrifice. This is what Scripture teaches us, but we don't always grasp it. This is why suffering is necessary. Returning to today's text, we see that this promise is fulfilled in Jesus. Jesus, having been victorious through the cross, is now seated at God's right hand. Yet we live in a world where many do not submit to him. Why is this? Because Jesus' victory, while achieved for humanity, must become a reality for each of us individually. This is why we are given life and why suffering plays a role in our growth. It can be hard to understand why suffering is part of this process, and when we face it, we not only deal with external challenges, but also internal struggles, self-doubt, regret, and resentment. Why does God lead us through these experiences? There's a poem by a Korean poet that expresses a similar sentiment. He describes an island surrounded by a fence of water, saying, because it's an island, the fence is the lowest. This imagery captures the idea of isolation and limitation. But through suffering, 
we come to understand the profound connection between our trials and the work of salvation.